Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Reviews in Review, the show where we round up all the game reviews published in IGN in the last month and then fire them out of a t-shirt cannon into the audience. Or summarize them, because you're probably busy and don't want to watch a lot of videos. That being said, there are a lot of reviews this month and I'm hot and I want to go drink lemonade and play in the yard, so let's get right to it. Travis Northup reviewed Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance, and though he really wanted to like the four-player co-op dungeon brawler, he had a laundry list of complaints. When playing co-op, he found it bland and repetitive, but it managed to be even worse when playing solo thanks to balancing issues that ramped up the difficulty to an unfair degree, and not in the fun way. And on top of all that, it's a buggy mess. And even if the bugs and balancing issues get patched, it doesn't sound like the underlying game is much to write home about. Really, the only nice things that Travis had to say is that Dark Alliance looks and sounds good, with character and environment designs doing the source material justice and some solid voice acting, even when the writing wasn't pulling its weight. It ended up with a 4 out of 10. Travis reviewed another fast-paced action game based on a beloved turn-based tabletop gaming franchise, and sadly, it only fared slightly better. Travis gave the Warhammer 40k-based shooter Necromunda Hired Gun a 5 out of 10, citing a bland and comically short story, and enemy AI which he called sharp as a grape. On the positive side, the gunplay shows glimmers of potential as a fast-paced Doom Eternal-esque shooter, and there's a dog companion you can summon with a squeaky toy and upgrade into a cybernetic beast. And yes, you can pet it, because we care about these things. Overall though, Necromunda's flaws outweigh its charms to the point that Travis didn't feel it was worth recommending. Amazingly, that wasn't the only game from the Warhammer universe to come out last month, and unfortunately, it also wasn't the only one to score a 5. John Bolding reviewed the turn-based strategy game Warhammer Age of Sigmar Stormground and found it disappointingly mediocre. Aside from a lot of bugs and inconsistent rules, John compared the amount of grinding to something you'd see in a free-to-play mobile game, and worse, there just isn't that much content to unlock to make it worth the trouble. He did appreciate that the combat is straightforward while still allowing for some interesting encounters, and that there was an option to paint your armies, which seems like it should be standard issue for every Warhammer game, because let's be realistic, Games Workshop, just as much of a paint workshop, they gotta sell that null oil. Alex Santa Maria checked out Wonder Boy, Asha in Monster World, which also scored a 5, and unless you're a diehard fan of the original Wonder Boy, it's probably not worth your time. It's a faithful remake of the original, but unfortunately the original just hasn't aged well, and Alex found that the updated graphics were hit or miss at best. So it just goes to show you that not every retro game is necessarily a classic. Tristan Ogilvy reviewed Sniper Ghost Warrior Contracts 2, scoring it a 6 out of 10, and while some of the long-range sniper shots were satisfying to pull off, the enemy AI is bad enough that it almost felt unfair. Coupled with uninspired challenges and an upgrade system that doesn't make a huge difference, Tristan wasn't blown away. I have no idea how to segue from a game about shooting people in the head to a colorful all-ages game about cartoon superheroines, so let's not even bother. Sarah LaBeouf reviewed DC Superhero Girls Teen Power, and that also scored a 6 out of 10. Sarah thought it was charming and enjoyable despite not doing anything too groundbreakingly innovative. Her biggest gripes were a camera that was more of a challenge during combat than the enemies, and some side quests that got incredibly repetitive. But as far as licensed games mostly aimed at kids go, it sounds like this could be a lot worse. Simon Carty reviewed Mario Golf Super Rush. He enjoyed it, calling it a comfort food game that took him to a happy place full of nostalgia for his memories of playing the original, but also felt it was a bit lackluster compared to previous entries in Nintendo's series about plumbers golfing with royalty and dinosaurs. Simon noted that Super Rush has some of the fun of earlier Mario Golf games, but a disappointingly short adventure mode, limited number of courses, and lack of variety and replayability made him less inclined to recommend it. Though the new Speed Golf mode, where you're forced to race on foot from shot to shot, is a fun addition. He scored it a 6 out of 10, which isn't bad, but is pretty disappointing for a Mario game. Luke Riley reviewed the co-op puzzle game Operation Tango, scoring it a 7 out of 10 for its clever, collaborative problem-solving idea where each player sees something completely different and they have to describe it to the other over voice chat. On the other hand, its short campaign isn't quite as replayable as it would like you to think, because once you know what both sides look like, a lot of the charm is lost. He also thought some of the puzzles drastically paled in comparison to others, but of course most co-op experiences make for a decently fun time if you're in good company. Seth Macy reviewed Legend of Mana, the remake of the PS1 classic that I might be pronouncing wrong, but I've been saying Mana that way for 25 years, so please leave me alone. Anyway, it had a similar issue to Wonder Boy in that it's faithful to a fault. 
Seth loved the combination of the pixelated characters on top of beautiful hand-drawn HD backgrounds. However, the structure of disconnected quests with limited guidance of where you're supposed to go next had some room for improvement by 2021 standards. And unfortunately, it's not possible to improve on them without screwing with the original Legend of Mana experience. So Legend of Mana got a seven out of 10 from Seth. He enjoyed it quite a bit, but he thinks you might need to rely on a walkthrough guide if it's your first time, or if you haven't played the original in recent memory. Gabriel Moss reviewed Blackwood, the latest expansion to the Elder Scrolls Online, and that scored a 7 as well. He thought it was a step up from last year's Greymoor expansion and liked how it returns to the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion's stomping grounds, acting as a prequel that taps into some nostalgia without feeling too familiar. Gabriel praised the writing, map layout, and companion system, but couldn't help but notice some of the cookie-cutter sameness to previous expansions and some poor voice acting. Then again, bad voice acting is part of the Oblivion experience, so it's not totally out of place. Overall, he doubts if Blackwood has enough new tricks to impress players who've gotten tired of ESO. Seth Macy was so disappointed by Legend of Mana's lack of direction that he set out to remake it from the ground up himself in Game Builder Garage. Okay, I'm kidding about the Legend of Mana, but he did learn a bit about how to make games from Nintendo's all-ages introduction to game design, which he gave an 8 for being a powerful game design tool that's simultaneously extremely accessible. In fact, he said it might be the most he's ever enjoyed learning. No programming knowledge is required, though Seth did wish there was a way to see what your creations look like as lines of code so that he could understand what was going on under the hood. That said, as a game that teaches kids of any age how to make games, it sounds like Nintendo stuck the landing. Despite having no shortage of other stuff to do during E3, that unstoppable dynamo of a workhorse Mitchell Saltzman volunteered to review Final Fantasy VII Remake colon Intergrade colon Episode Intermission, and he integrated it an iterate out of Tentergrade. Despite being fairly short in terms of playtime, the DLC isn't short on charm or stuff to do. Mitchell was a big fan of Yuffie, whose fast-paced combat style feels pulled straight from an action game, and whose upbeat personality stood out against the dismal Midgar backdrop. Ultimately, it's really good DLC, but it's still just DLC rather than a full-fledged expansion. Since Intergrade was so short, Mitchell apparently also had plenty of time to review the extremely long Scarlet Nexus, which he also scored an 8. The ambitious anime-styled action RPG manages to successfully blend the fast-paced character action you'd see in something like Bayonetta or Devil May Cry with the sprawling storytelling you'd see in RPG series like Persona and the Tales of games. Mitchell did note that the environments paled in comparison to the enemy designs, and some of the combat encounters got repetitive by the tail end. You see, Scarlet Nexus has two campaigns that each run about 20 hours, but thankfully, progress carries over from one to the other, kind of like a New Game Plus, which makes it way easier to burn through if you're just after the story. All right, now onto the nines and buckle up because there's a whole bunch of them. Jonathan Dornbush reviewed one of the most anticipated games of the year so far, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, and it got a nine out of 10. He had almost entirely positive things to say about Insomniac's latest, which he thought was one of the best looking games he's ever played and a great showcase of what the PS5 can do. The platforming and goofy weaponry is some of the best of the series, and the story strikes a great balance between cartoony comedy and some genuine heartfelt moments. His only gripes were that Rift Apart doesn't do more with the new 3D audio tech and that a few mechanics derail the pacing, in one case literally to a snail's pace when you have to ride around on a space snail. Luckily, the snail is very fast, but still, it's not quite as engaging as the platforming. Also, Jonathan was able to almost 100% Rift Apart in under 20 hours, which might not be enough bang for some people's bucks. Dornbush grew up with the Ratchet & Clank games, so it might be easy to blame his enthusiasm on nostalgia, but I'll back him up here. Rift Apart was only my second Ratchet & Clank game, and I've never been that wild about the character designs or invested in the universe, but I still had a blast and was regularly gawking at how good this game looks. If you're like me, play it and then pretend you're playing a Rocket Raccoon game, which really is what I kind of wish it was in my head. After taking a brief nap, Mitchell Saltzman, who seriously deserves a raise, also reviewed Guilty Gear Strive. He thought it raised the bar for anime-like fighters with stunning visuals, solid netcode, and satisfying gameplay that lived up to Guilty Gear's reputation. He did note that some tweaks have been made to the combo system that made it easier to pull off high damage combos, but slightly harder to land them, which results in a slower pace than Guilty Gear fans might be used to, but mechanically, it all comes together nicely. Another game that lets you beat up and or get beaten by strangers over the internet is Chivalry 2, which Leanna Hafer reviewed and also scored a 9. She thought the medieval combat simulator found the elusive sweet spot between accessible dumb fun and rewarding skill-based mechanics, aside from noting some balancing issues like maps that are pitched in favor of one team's objectives or some wonkiness with matchmaking when players switch teams, Leanna had mostly nice things to say about Chivalry 2. I've played a bit of this one too and it made me very happy that Leanna's having as much fun as I am because I felt validated. So it seems like whether you're somebody who's really good at video games and wants a new skill set to master so you can feel 
like good at stuff or you're a total idiot like me who wants to run around screaming and swinging a halberd all over the place and throwing random pumpkins and chickens and books at people. Chivalry manages to be fun for both those things. Anyway, speaking of throwing stuff at people, that is what Knockout City is all about, and Jarrett Green also gave that a 9 out of 10, calling it one of the best team-based PvP games to come out in years. This weird thing combines the fun of schoolyard dodgeball with surprisingly deep tactical gameplay that you might not expect from the premise or cartoony aesthetic, and really, it's surprising that nobody's done this sooner. Dodgeball is fun as hell on its own, and Knockout City injects the time-tested formula with some fantastical video gamey mechanics that would be physically impossible or horribly unsafe in real life, like sniper balls, multi-balls, time bomb balls, or the ability for players to turn into balls themselves and be thrown around. Jarrett did note some issues with matchmaking, like starting a game mid-match on a team of idle players, but he had mostly good stuff to say. Plus, it doesn't hurt that it's free to play for the first 25 levels with fairly harmless microtransactions. If you spent your time during recess coloring in the corner instead of playing dodgeball, you might be more interested in Chicory, A Colorful Tale, which Rebecca Valentine reviewed and which also, also, surprise, scored a 9 out of 10. Rebecca described the top-down puzzle adventure as a bit like a Zelda game, but without combat. Instead, Chicory's primary mechanic is the ability to color anything in the initially black and white world. As you'd expect, this makes for a charming laid-back experience, but Rebecca was especially complimentary of how Chicory has just the right amount of stuff for you to do. It doesn't feel too light, but it also isn't saturated with tertiary activities, though there are side quests, collectibles, and optional activities if you really want to run the gamut of what it has to offer. In contrast to its twee aesthetic, Rebecca lauded Chicory's very real story, which, without spoiling anything, should resonate with anyone who makes stuff, art, or otherwise. Also, props to any art nerds who caught that I just used the words primary, secondary, tertiary, light, saturated, contrast, and gamut while giving you the broad strokes on a game where you color stuff in. Just a little art school humor for you. If you'd rather play a colorful game that doesn't make you do the coloring in yourself, Griftlands is just that, and surprise, surprise, that got yet another nine, this time from Travis Northup, who really had to earn it by reviewing two stinkers this month. Travis was thoroughly impressed with how many different genres Grifflands managed to combine, blending a roguelike loop with strategic trading card game deck building, multiple story-driven RPG campaigns, and the social lengths of a visual novel, which it somehow does without collapsing under the weight of its own ambition. I could barely read all those words without stammering. Anyway, though each of its three campaigns is fairly short, they're immensely replayable thanks to unlockable modifiers, difficulties, and alternate game modes. And if any of that video game word salad I just served up made your ears perk up, you might want to give Grifflands a shot. And there you have it, a ton of games came out in June, and luckily a lot of them were really awesome. What are you playing, new or otherwise? I finished Ratchet, I loved it, I'm still throwing chickens and crap at people in chivalry, but I'm also finally crossing Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus off my backlog list. I love the first one, but for whatever reason missed the second when it first came out. It's on Game Pass now, and I'm really excited to see what the studio does with Indiana Jones. Also, the first two Far Cry games were dirt cheap, so I thought I would take a, a f flaming uh, malaria-infected trip down memory lane before Far Cry 6 comes out and see how that compares in the grand scheme of things. Aren't video games great? Anyway, if you want to look ahead at what's coming out in July, I made a video all about that too. I will see you in a month to tell you which of those games were superstar grand slams and which were big fat stinkers. That's my new review scale. A game is either a superstar grand slam or it's a big fat stinker. There's nothing in between and I refuse to explain my reasoning one way or the other. And with that, I bid you adieu. Adieu? Adieu? Adieu means chaos. I bid you the, the nice one. Farewell, friends. Goodbye. Thank you.